Um, I want to welcome everybody to the Pests in Progress webinar. This is uh, funded by the North Central IPM Center. I'm Lene Jessen, the co-director of the North Central IPM Center, and we're one of four regional IPM centers that are supported by the USDA NIFA Crop Protection and Pest Management Regional Coordination Program. We have a mission to coordinate IPM across the region and across the country. And we're conducting this webinar series to give the opportunity for the project directors to report on their crop protection and pest management grants. Today, we're actually having two speakers. Um, we're gonna have Lee Miller, who's gonna talk about the Missouri IPM highlights. And then we have Xi Zhang, who will be talking on developing a novel mechanical strategy for control of bill bug. Uh, Lee is gonna go first. And I wanna let everybody know that if you have questions during the talk, please put them in the Q&A. It should be on the locate, uh, located on the bottom bar of your control panel. Lee is the IPM coordinator at the University of Missouri. He's an associate professor along with being the IPM coordinator. Um, I, he has provided us some links. So I'll be putting them in the chat while he's talking there to some of his websites um, and some of the publications that he'll be talking about. So without further ado, Lee, welcome and thank you for doing this webinar. Thank you very much, Lene, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been given the auspicious task of trying to cover four years of extension and research in the integrated pest management area um, with, with various different programs that, that all contribute. Um, most of this is, is going to be involved in, in row crop ag. Um, so we're about 80, 80 to 90 percent within that programmatic area. Um, but then we also have quite a bit of horticulture in there as well. Um, so a little bit later on in the program, I'll show you all the people that are involved in this. Um, and why it's so hard to, to summarize everyone's incredible work that they've done uh, within this program. So IPM, obviously integrated pest management, and, and you can see our, our major programmatic areas there all within the auspices of, of MU Extension. Um, and as we went forward, and, and I'm sure you've heard this in, in some of the other presentations and as well, Within the last uh, two years, you know, obviously coronavirus and, and the pandemic has, has really put a strain on our extension system um, and really hasn't allowed us to, to conduct things in, in a real traditional manner. manner. Um, but there is a, a, a silver lining to this, though, is that it forced us into some non-traditional means. So you change the IPM to IMP and that's IMP. So the devilish sprite here would be the coronavirus and the pandemic. But what it's actually allowed us to do is include more people. Um, and I, I think that what we've done uh, just within the last two years and this adaptability that's, that's, um, that the programming makes, makes possible uh, really has, has allowed this program to, to flourish um, maybe even, even more than it would have uh, without the pandemic. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about some of the ways that that's happened. Um, our IPM website is, is really the major conduit um, for everything that we do in, in our extension and outreach. We had a big redesign in 2016 that re resulted in a, a huge influx of viewers. Um, this leveled off in 2018, as you can see there, but, but rebounded back as, as we got into the pandemic. Within our IPM website, we have three newsletters that our state and regional extension specialists contribute to. All of these are, are timely topics um, that, that really kind of hit to the heart of, of crop and horticulture uh, production and management. These include the Missouri Environment and Garden, which are for horticulture, the Integrated Pest and Crop Management, which is for uh, row crop and big ag, and then also the Missouri Produce Growers Bulletin, uh, which we, we put in just a few uh, years ago for commercial horticulture. All those are housed on the website. The most commonly viewed articles within those um, are reaching 50 to 100,000 views each. Um, so we are, we are really, they're also kind of driven by um, an email subscription service. So when they get put up on the, on the web, um, there's, a, there's a large amount. I think that uh, the MEG or the Environment and Garden is somewhere around 1,700 subscribers and, and IPCM is somewhere around 800 subscribers. So we do put that out. Um, quite broadly to, to a large email subscription service. Within the website, we also house the pest monitoring network, which I'm gonna talk about later, which monitors six prominent insect pests throughout the state. Uh, we also have all of our publications linked there. 
and links to some of our other web resources from our other programs, um, such as the Missouri Frost Freeze Guide, which was produced by Pat Ganan, the Plant Diagnostic Clinic uh, with Dr. Pong Tian, and then our Weed Science Program with Dr. Kevin Bradley, um, and also Plant Pathology with Dr. Cantlin Bissonette and Insects with Dr. Kevin Rice. So all of that is kind of integrated within that IPM website. Mm -hmm. So within that, when we got to the, the pandemic in March of 2020, we realized as extension personnel that we were kind of stuck. Um, the old ways of in-person communication, some of the ways that, that we normally would communicate with field, even outside field days, really were no longer valid. Um, so we had to adapt and, and we did so rather quickly. So with the guidance and, access, and assistance of our, our regional extension specialists who also were stuck, we built this framework of, of town halls um, and basically on a weekly basis throughout the season and forage livestock and also through horticulture, um, around noontime, we would try to capture our clientele and bring them into um, either a Zoom teleconference or later we adapted and went to a YouTube live. Um, so this is the, the forage and, and, uh, and livestock town hall group. This probably isn't all of them, um, but this is really who drove this. Um, and it was, it was kind of neat because we had all of our regional extension specialists and state specialists working together, and they really traded off leadership and traded off topics um, as we went throughout the season. In fact, it was so, um, so uh, good that we couldn't let it go for 2021. Um, and despite us getting back to some limited in-person, we've continued that throughout 20, 2021. And I th think it's really going to be a standard of the program as we move forward. Uh, this group actually submitted um, and they were a national finalist to the NACAA Agricultural Awareness and Appreciation Award. So it really shows the, the value of their efforts there. And moving forward, again, I told you that we had uh, horticulture and forage livestock. You can see here the total number of attendees. We've had 55 horticulture town halls and 58 forage livestock town halls since we started this on April 8th of 2020 throughout the grant period. Um, you can see the average attendee there per, per Zoom session. And then as we went forward and we realized that we we're getting kind of good at it, um, we actually uh, promoted this and put it onto YouTube Live. Um, so that way we could have a live audience that maybe wasn't uh, into the Zoom session. Then we also were able to save it in that manner as well. So as we started going through this, particularly after two or three of these, we realized, A, we can record off of Zoom, uh, which we're recording now, and B, that we were kind of losing some of our, um, our, these great presentations that were being made. So since that first one on April 8th, and we probably didn't start until we got into May, we produced 275 videos for our YouTube channel, which honestly, before this, I didn't even realize existed. Um, we only had one or two videos up on our Mizzou IPM uh, YouTube channel, and now we've got 275. Um, so all of these were produced out of these town halls, and we call them the snippets. So hopefully we could capture our audience in four or five minutes um, type, of, type of videos in that manner. So this is an example of the Forage Livestock snippets. So far, we've produced 59 of these videos. They've reached almost 25,000 views. Uh, we're gonna scroll through some of, uh, some of those as, as we go through these. The most popular was on feeding programs for growing calves, and that was given by Dr. Eric Bailey. And that one's garnered over 11,000 views thus far. The next one, home horticulture, we had even more. We've had 61 videos that we've produced. Again, some of these are from our state extension specialists and others are from our regional extension specialist. Um, the, they've garnered over 35,000 views at this point. Again, we did not have this kind of popularity in our YouTube channel before we started this. Um, the most popular here was on zucchini, cucumber, and squash rots by Robert Balick, and that one's been viewed over 19,000 times. So the commercial horticulture group started to go down this path of using town halls, but they decided that they weren't really getting the buy-in on a live. Um, so they adapted very quickly, which is what we've all had to do. Um, and they use a dot mailer format. So they would produce their videos and they would put it all out through an email subscription service. Um, so from that, we've produced over, 
produced 155 videos, and that was off of bi-monthly newsletters, um, almost 17,000 views. Um, the most popular on this was on cross-arm trellis systems, um, which is, has about 1,500 or 2,000 views thus far. My favorite one there is on flooded produce, and you can see the flooded produce road sign there, which I think is kind of cool. So as I said, I didn't even realize we had a YouTube channel for Mizzou IPM. Um, and we started from four or five subscribers. And since we've gone through, we're, we're over 820 at this point. You can also see there the increase in daily views. Um, so you can see that despite being stuck in our offices, we're actually reaching more people this way um, and, and really putting out a lot of valuable content. So like I said earlier, there's a, there's a number of folks that are involved in the Missouri IPM. Um, I think we're one of uh, a unique uh, IPM programs that we actually fund our own multimedia specialist, Jared Fogue. And I will tell you that not much would be possible without all of his work. I can't monitor the daily, daily uh, inquiries that are coming in, whether it be for our newsletters or the, to the town halls. So he's done a fabulous job. We also have had a really huge buy-in from our regional extension specialists. And that, that starts from way back when we started the IPM program that we actually were getting everybody together for Zoom and, and for all whatever other um, teleconference environments that we had before it was so popular. And every Wednesday we would meet to kind of get ground truth from our extension specialist and then also connect with our state extension specialist on campus. So we've had a really good buy-in from them. Um, but over these next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about some of our individual programs within the IPM program. Um, and you'll notice there that the arrows kind of are double-sided there. So there is that interplay of, of back and forth between our state extension specialist and our regional extension specialist. So the first one that I'll go through is, is Dr. Kevin Bradley, Mandy Bish, and, and Michelle Warman, who kind of um, all collaborated when this weed science and horticulture, and I'll talk about some of that, but look at all of the folks that are underneath them as well um, that really were gaining experience in IPM. Dr. Kevin Rice came on in 2018 in, in field crop entomology, and then Dr. Caitlin Bissonette and Dr. John Laurie kind of collaborated with plant pathology and also with strip trials. And you can see all of the people that we're accumulating here, and this really is the future, future generation of our IPM scientists that, that we're looking at here. Um, all of that really being impacted um, by this grant um, and by the IPM program. And then last but definitely not least are, are a number of our other state expansion, extension specialists, particularly Ta Dr. Pat Ganan, who gives us weather updates. Of course, weather is so important for our pest outbreaks. Dr. Pong Tan, who has started with us this that last year in the plant diagnostic clinic. Uh, Dr. Mangela Nathan in the Soil Testing Laboratory and Drs. Dave Trinkline and Hank Stelzer work in, in horticulture. All of this is, is really the framework and the background bone of our Missouri IPM program. And I'm just here talking about all the great work that these folks are doing. So we'll start off with our weed science and, and one of the projects that was funded in, in the IPM um, that is really uh, has and continues receiving much interest is the sensitivity of non-soybean plants to synthetic oxen herbicides. Obviously, soybeans came out with, um, with oxen herbicide resistance, um, and we were having drift problems like many others uh, throughout the community. We utilized USDA funds to screen 18 ornamental species and eight common annual flowering plants for sensitivity to 2,4-D and to dicamba. Through a series of measurements such as visual injury, stem diameters, total flowers, our former grad, or the former graduate student within the weed science program here, Brian Dentelman, demonstrated that sensitivity varies by plant species. Some of our species such as hydrangea and plant and raspberries are quite tolerant to both herbicides, while others are more sensitive to 2,4-D and others are more sensitive to dicamba. Um, so that's that's very important information going forward as we were kind of emerging and, and kind of getting through this, this crisis of, of dicamba and 2,4-D drift. So um, this is some information from Michelle Warmond, um, who is our horticultural specialist, who also collaborated with this project. Um, some of the studies that, that she also was doing that she found some partial mitigation of oxen herbicide injury on tomatoes using 
uh, film forming antitransparents. Um, she was looking at tomato uh, cultivars, looking at the loss of reproductive capacity. She also does quite a bit of work of, on elderberry and actually produced uh, two publications on elderberry during, um, uh, during this uh, grant period. But she also looked at the sensitivity during different floral development, um, looked at apple and tree growth over a four year evaluation period. And then lastly, looked at uh, evaluation of, of the residue on tomato, elderberry, peach, and apple fruit. Um, so you can see this is a very, very broad project here within our weed science program. So Brian and, and uh, Dr. Warman's research was and continues to be shared with multiple art audiences, um, such as pesticide applicators, state regulators, row crop producers, and, our, and at horticulture conferences. The plants were used for demonstrations at field days and images were included in the herbicide injury app, um, which also was developed during this granting period. Um, as we look through a few examples of some additional resources that are, that are being developed, uh, we've been surveying, or this, this group has been surveying row crop producers. Um, they did first on, on their views on the dicamba situation, on how they, how they felt um, how felt they felt it was impacting their area. Um, and then currently they're actually being uh, surveyed on how they like to receive information, um, which is something we don't really think about very often is, is how does our new generation of, of, of producer, if they are the new generation producer, how are they, how are they digesting the information? Um, and, and some of that is, is being summarized now. Um, also, there was a fact sheet uh, developed by MU Weed Scientists as, and as part of a collaboration with other, other universities in the Take Action on Herbicide Resistance Weed Management Group. Um, so you can see that, that fact sheet here on managing 2,4 and, and 24 d and dicamba. And then lastly, we have a, a broad weed ID app, which was um, as both on, on our website and also as a mobile app um, that can be downloaded as well that's, that's part of this group. So now I'm going to get into the entomologies portion, and um, I, I'd really like to, to thank again Dr. Kevin Rice for taking over our pest monitoring network. Um, in the past, we've we've done ten or eleven different insect species, um, and we really have boiled that down um, to a number of key insect species that we're monitoring throughout the state. We have a much better framework for how to do this um, than we did in the past. Um, so our trappers are our regional extension specialists that, that all throughout this network, throughout the season, um, report trap captures, which then uh, we will put up on the website. You can see this is the, uh, the home page for the pest monitoring network. You can go into any one of those map sections and see if there's pest alerts in the area. Um, obviously in October, there, there aren't many, um, but also by refining and really getting down to these three species were, uh, Dr. Rice is working with other collaborating institutions to try and get more of a regional network started and really get um, some of that data in that would, would have real research merit um, on, a, on a widespread basis. Um, so this is, if you were to click on fall armyworm, which is, is all the rage this year. Um, I'm not an entomologist, but, but I know enough to, to, to be dangerous here. Um, you can see where our regional, you can see where our trap locations are, much better spread throughout the state. Um, you can go at any point and view all of the counts for that year, as well as more information, such as an identification field scouting. Um, and you can see more information on the pest. But if you were to, to go on the, the trap counts and look throughout the whole year, you can see where those, those counts were um, by region and then also by county. Um, and which of those traps, trap counts were really um, sparking off those, uh, those alerts and those, those kind of uh, thresholds, um, threshold levels. Another project that uh, Dr. Rice did with, with uh, Kelsey Benthal, his, his graduate student, um, is looking at insecticide impregnated nets for Japanese beetle control. Um, Japanese beetles obviously have... Uh, not really an invasive pest anymore. They've, they've kind of made their, their home here. Um, and when it comes to row crop ag agriculture, um, this is in soybeans, the grower standard is three insecticide applications, which obviously has an, an economical and, and also environmental um, uh, aspect to it that uh, hopefully we could, we could get that down or, or maybe even eliminate it 
by using insecticidal impregnated nets that were combined with a pheromone or an attractant to attract those Japanese beetles and, and hopefully get them without uh, bringing out the sprayer. Um, now, unfortunately, the, there was low Japanese beetle pressure um, for some of these uh, some of these trials, but so there's really not much difference there in defoliation. Um, and if you look at this, you know, the difference between a 2% defoliation is not going to be economically significant for our soybean growers. By the way, I, I should also point out that, you know, we have 5.5 million acres of soybeans here. Um, so this is when you think about all the insecticide that's used over all those acre, acres, um, this could be a, a very good um, alternative to, to those practices. What was really interesting though, is, is digging down more into, into their data is that the nets reduce the seed damage. Um, and what happened is, is that the attract and kill actually was reducing the, uh, was, was promoting the, the, um, the beneficial species. And the dark spots on the, on the soybean seeds that are seed there are very characteristic of stink bug damage. Um, and I tried to grow tomatoes this year and I can tell you how many stink bugs we had out. Um, so this is something that is economically significant in a good way um, that the attract and kill does not provide um, as opposed to um, broad-based sprays of insecticides. And they did some, some captures and they found that there was the nets increase the natural enemies of the stink bugs um, and therefore reduce those late season pests. So there is an economic benefit um, to using those insecticide impreg impregnated nets as opposed to those broad based sprays. And there's not a detriment when it comes to the damage that was seen on the, on the uh, soybean plots. In fact, it was uh, to the benefit of using uh, those nets instead of those sprays. And I should, excuse me, I should say that all of those have gone into um, also into publications and also into, into talks and things of that nature. So last but not least, uh, getting into the plant pathology side. Um, this is a collaboration between Dr. Caitlin Bissonette, our field crop plant pathologist, and also Dr. John Laurie. Um, and our strip trial program is, is quite unique in, in, uh, in Missouri and, and throughout the United States. Uh, was started in 2016. Um, since that, they have over 300 site years of trials on Missouri farmer fields um, and over 100 site years just on cover crop trials. Um, they, the strip trial program had 70 strip, tri strip trials on Missouri farms in just in 2020 alone. Um, so we kind of got in on that game and, and used some of the IPM funding to look at things, particularly soybean cyst nematode, um, and then also uh, weed management within some of these cover cropping systems. So they are still in the, in the process of, of kind of going through and summarizing this data. Um, but I do want to kind of show a couple slides to kind of show some of the differences among some of the different sites. Um, here, they're looking at the reproductive factor of, of soybean cyst nematodes um, at one particular site. And if you look at if that RF is below one, then the SCN numbers are actually decreasing. And if they're above one, uh, they actually are increasing. So you can see some of the differences there among the no cropper crop, the cereal rye, and also the winter wheat. As we go forward, you can see that there are differences among sites, which is why they're uh, they're working on summarizing this data, but you can see some of the same trends that are going on there as well as the, as the different site. Another aspect of what Dr. Bissonette is, is doing um, with, with some of this funding is that some of our, we have, you know, Missouri is a keystone state. So we are getting some of these new and emerging diseases um, such as tar spot. So tar spot was previously confirmed um, in a couple counties up in the Northeast region of the state, just through some of the Sentinel plots and, and looking more closely and some of the directed surveys we're finding, of it, unfortunately, in, in many other, um, many other counties, uh, actually eight new counties just in 2021 alone. Also, we're looking at other Sentinel plots throughout the state that have been established. Um, and fortunately, no tar spot was detected at the Sentinel plots but we're having numerous other diseases and we're able to 
uh, relay that on to our uh, to our communities, uh, our soybean and our corn producers, to really give them notification of of these pathogens and these diseases that might be impacting them at a, at a very rapid basis. Another part of this was fungicide resistance detection and Cercospora sojina, the causal agent of frog, spot, frog eye leaf spot on soybean. Um, we weren't sure how widespread fungicide resistance uh, was particularly to the, uh, the strobularins, particularly to the zoxystrobin. Um, so this is uh, Bruna McGregor's uh, thesis work. She had 15 different counties that she surveyed and found that uh, over two thirds of the isolates that she collected were azoxystrobin resistant, um, which was a surprise not only to, to us, but also to the farmers um, and really indicates that fungicide resistance management practices should be, um, should be in place to try and, and manage this resistance. So all of this was, was boiled down into a scouting schools program that was started up by Dr. Bissonette when she started in 2018 and as part of this IPM program. Um, they were located in all four quadrants of the state and each year over a hundred farmers, cooperators, extension specialists and stakeholders were trained in identifying and managing the common soybean and corn diseases that were impacting production in Missouri. In addition, we, they were bleeding in uh, this fungicide resistance management and also the sentinel uh, plots and also the tar spot information as these producers were being trained on the basics of fungicide resistance management, uh, the potential impact of resistance on production and which of these pathogens were considered high risk. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, they weren't conducted in 2020, but was resumed again in 2021. So to wrap everything up, um, I'd like to just uh, just thank, and, and I should say that this is gonna be a new dawn for Missouri IPM. Um, I will be resigning as, as IPM coordinator. I'm actually leaving and going to another institution. Um, but before I do so, I'd like to just not get choked up, but tell you how, how uh, great it's been to be a part of this team, um, particularly since 2017. Really the collaboration that's gone into the IPM, you show, I showed you that slide with a million and one names on it, um, you know, kind of collaborating and getting together and really moving this program forward has been a real enriching experience for me. And in particular, I'd like to thank who I call the special K's, uh, Dr. Caitlin Bissonnette, Dr. Kevin Br Bradley, and Dr. Kevin Rice, who lead the three aspects in, in weed science, plant pathology, and entomology. Um, they've been really a driving force in, in carrying this program forward. And I'd like to thank him for that. Also, I, I mentioned Jared Fogue, who, who really uh, we leaned on quite a bit, particularly in 2020 uh, when we, we had that need. Um, he is, he's been a, a great, um, I, I dare not say call him an employee, uh, really a, a partner in moving this program forward. And that being said, uh, moving this program forward, uh, the new IPM coordinator will be Dr. Mandy Bish, who works in Dr. Kevin Bradley's program, already been instrumental um, in, in really uh, moving forward the objectives of the IPM program. Um, and she's gonna be a great leader moving forward. And I, I think she's on this call. So, uh, so maybe she wants to turn on her video and, and actually you know, wave and say hi and all of that kind of good stuff. So with that, um, that's all that I have. Uh, Lene, were there any questions that, that I can address? Um, we had a couple of questions and I think we have time for one or two. Uh, one of the questions we have, you, the videos that you did look great and you had a lot of people that are watching those. Have you thought about how you might evaluate those videos on if <laughs> they made any changes in IPM? And I know that's kind of an impossible question to answer, but with, I know we could even use some of that information if you've thought about it for our YouTube channel. Yeah, that's, that's very difficult. When you put something on YouTube, you really don't um, have a lot of interaction. You know, you're basically relying on, you know, if, if a thousand people watch a video, you might get four comments back. Um, and, and sometimes they're, you know, saying that's terrible, terrible video. Um, so, I think that one of the aspects, you know, within the Zoom and using the town hall format, that might be a way to, to use polls. We've, we've used a couple polls within the Zoom format. Um, but when it comes to the YouTube videos, they really become really static. 
Um, another thing that, that we're thinking about integrating um, is potentially when it comes to our publications and in our newsletter, um, can we put a little poll up in the top, um, just, a, just radio buttons is as, as good as you're gonna get, um, and see if we can maybe track um, behavioral change that way over time. Um, but that would, yeah, when it comes to the videos and, and actually getting to behavior change and impact, that's a pretty tall task and tall order. Yep. Um, another question was, does your program have a social media presence? And if so, how does it feed into the resources you've created? It, it does. So we both have a, a Twitter and Facebook accounts um, really that have, have blossomed after starting this. Um, whenever we have any of our newsletters that come out, uh, we promote those. Whenever we have a town hall, um, we're promoting those. I think at this point we have about, I don't know what the difference is, but maybe around 600 likes or follows on Facebook and somewhere around 700 followers on Twitter. Um, we also have uh, started a Twitter feed on our website, which I think has helped, um, that not only links to our IPM webs, uh, IPM Twitter feeds, but then also through weed science and also uh, our plant pathology. So really trying to get all of those IPM social medias, hopefully in one spot uh, where they can be viewed and um, you know, they're, they're in so many different places. And, and I should say one more time that uh, that's why it's so critical for us to have Jared Fogue as our, as our multimedia specialist, you know, within a university framework, it's just, it, it's difficult for me to stay on track with all the different outlets and, and all the different outreach that we can be involved in. Um, and Jared does a great job in, in doing that. And, and within a, a university extension system, I think it would be pretty impossible without just having one dedicated individual. All right, thank you. I don't know if you're able to type into the chat, but if you can, would you be willing to put in your Twitter feed and your Facebook? Address? Absolutely, okay, yes. Great. All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and move on. We wanna give she plenty of time to do her talk, uh, but we really appreciate it, Lee. Thank you for everything you've done and we will miss you. Um, when we have I will our miss you too, Monet. Thank you. <laughs>